Uh, hello everyone, thank you for coming. I'll be talking about uh, damage assessment of a railway bridge using fiber optic sensing and LIDAR data. Uh, so I'll start with an overview of the project in general and then move on to the topic of this particular talk, which is comparing data from fiber brag gratings, FBGs, and uh, analysis of laser scan data. Um, so this bridge, CFM5, it's in North Yorkshire in the UK. It was built in 1869. Uh, so 150 years old, uh, Masonry Arch Railway Bridge, uh, with a skew angle of about 27 degrees. Um, this bridge was in substandard condition. Network Rail were concerned about it, but they knew that in a few years' time they would have to knock it down when the line was electrified, so they don't want to spend too much money in the interim if they can get away with that. Uh, so that's a prime candidate for structural health monitoring. You can see what do you need to do, and then you don't do any more than that. Um, Although, unfortunately, they did repair the bridge before we could get our sensors on it, but that's a different story. Um, and then the scope grew from condition monitoring. Um, it became a collaboration with ACOM and CSIC looking at different monitoring technologies. And there was this additional project goal of finding alternative technologies that could compete with Network Rail's deflection pole method. So a deflection pole is Network Rail sends someone in a van and they go to the bridge with an LVDT on a stick. They put the LVDT under the bridge and they measure the vertical deflections at the arch crown um, as a train is passing overhead, um, and uh, that gives them vertical displacement measurements, but it requires direct access to the bridge. Um, and as you can see with this bridge, CFM5, it's passing over an A road, um, so you have to close the road every time you want to take measurements. And in particular, every time you close the road, you need a 38-mile diversionary route. Uh, if you can make out in this little red box here, that's the bridge. In order to get one mile down the road, you have to go 38 miles around the bridge. Um, the reason it's so big is because it's an A road and you need to accommodate lorry traffic. Um, but this is not an unusual situation. There are tens of thousands of masonry arch bridges in the UK, um, and many of them cross roads or they might carry a road over a railway. You can imagine if you have to close traffic every time you want to take a measurement, you're going to get into trouble pretty quickly. Um, and this bridge, as I said, 150 years old, so it's on the older end of the spectrum, but we have a lot of masonry arch bridges that are between 100 and 150 years old in the UK. So you can imagine the kinds of challenges we're having with this bridge. In a few years' time, a couple of decades, we're going to get a large number of bridges with similar troubles. So we need to come up with better ways of doing structural health monitoring now before we have a bigger problem in the future. So our collaboration with ACOM looked at alternative monitoring technologies. Here's the monitoring installation we put on the bridge, various different sensors you can see on the right in the photograph. So we've got videogrammetry, fiber brag gratings or FBGs, monitoring crack behavior and principal strains on the arch. Um, and uh, ACOM put a network of point sensors, including linear potentiometers, laser distometer, and uh, strain gauges. Um, I'm focusing on the FBGs today, but uh, maybe ask me a question about the other sensors if you're interested. Um, and I mentioned this, this bridge has a 27 degree skew angle. Uh, for people who don't know, a skew arch bridge is effectively, um, if you imagine you have a regular square arch, masonry arch bridge, um, that would effectively be a rectangle in plan. If you shear that, you skew the bridge. Um, now you have a longer skewed span as well as your shorter original square span. The angle between those spans is the skew angle. Um, and as soon as you have a skewed bridge, there are some questions about how is your bridge actually behaving. Uh, it's much more un unclear what the load path through your bridge is. You might assume if your bridge is wide enough, then you can open up effectively a strip in the square span direction that provides a sh the shortest available load path. You might assume that's the preferable load path. But if your bridge is a bit narrow, Maybe you can't achieve that. Uh, and there's a lack of experimental data to establish the true behavior. So uh, this is the first time that uh, principal strains have mapped the flow of force in a skewed arch bridge. But you need that kind of data to establish what's really going on. And you can also ask questions about, is your load path through your skewed bridge affected by things like uh, stereotomy, construction technique, how they built the bridge, uh, or maybe damage or repair work as well. Uh, there have been some studies with FE analysis of skewed arches. This is a paper by Bill Harvey. He did an FE analysis of a skewed bridge, and he found that the locus of the center of thrust, so the centroid of your distributed thrust, follows the skewed span. Um, there was a small amount of displacement uh, data backing that up, but you know, there's a large gap for experimental data in this area. Looking again at CFM5, there are notable cracks which you might be able to see here and here, separating the spandrel walls and the arch. Another longitudinal crack in the southeastern quadrant. Uh, in 2016, they did repair this bridge. They put 10 tie rods through in the transverse direction. They also stitched through every single spandrel wool stone. You can see a small gray patch there. That's the grout on top of the stitch. Um, so there's a steel rod through every single stone, clamping it back onto the arch. Uh, the reason they went for such a 
thorough intervention is because pumping is a big problem with masonry arch bridges. If you get these separation cracks between your spandrel and your arch, which you might expect given the huge stiffness differential between your arch and your spandrel wall, then your arch can move almost independently. It can start pumping and developing much larger displacements than the adjacent spandrel wall. And as soon as you have that, you can deteriorate your arch quite quickly. Uh, so it is a big problem for masonry arch bridges. Here's that monitoring installation again with the skewed span and the square span marked on. So I'm going to look at fiber brag ratings. For anyone who doesn't know, uh, FB FBG fiber brag rating is a point sensor which is embedded into a fiber optic sensor as it's manufactured. Effectively, as you're drawing the wire, there's a small region about eight millimeters long where you periodically vary the refractive index of your fiber. Um, you effectively put a little barcode, except it's a boring barcode where all the bars are the same width and they're evenly separated. Uh, but that gives you a brag wavelength and light at that wavelength is strongly reflected by your FBG. And as you can imagine, as you strain that fiber, you change the variation of that uh, periodicity. That shifts your Bragg wavelength. You can measure that shift with an interrogator and convert that into strain. Um, here's some information with a micron optics analyzer. You can get uh, up to one kilohertz sampling frequency with four fibers, up to 20 FPGs on a single fiber. So you have up to 80 sensors in a standard installation. Um, cannot make out these photos at all in this light, but um, here's the installation of the FPGs. Uh, here's typical data from an FBG. Uh, the noise is about plus or minus one or two micro strains, so very accurate. And with the one kilohertz sampling frequency, you can make out individual wheels as the axles pass over. So this is the leading axle of the train or the first carriage, the rear axle of the first carriage. So this is a single carriage, second carriage, third carriage. This is a three carriage train passing over that bridge. Um, with the FBGs, what we did that was one of the things we did that was novel in this. Uh, bridge is that we installed them in this triangular rosette formation. So with these triangles, you have three strains. Three strains is enough to describe your generalized strain states averaged over the 0.25 meter square area of your triangle. With that data, you can get principal strains uh, and you can get the directions and magnitudes of principal strains and map that over the bridge using your Moore circle of principal strains. Um, and if you get a distribution, it's not very, not very clear the time histories. The main thing I want to point out with this is that with a regular installation of FBGs just doing two lines longitudinally, you get, yes, one line here, top line, one line here, the middle line. But as soon as you have your three strains, you get much more dense, much, much more dense information. So you're getting two principal strains and an orientation at every single point. So there's much richer information from doing it this way. Um, it's easier to visualize these things with, with uh, quiver plots. Uh, as a train on the northern track passes from point A to point F, as the axle is above each of these rosettes, this is the distribution you get. So what we can see is that these, there's, um, although there are two principal strains, we're seeing one dominant principal strain, much, one much larger arrow at each point. Uh, and these larger arrows are aligned with the skewed span direction, so not the square span direction. And that is more or less the case at every single point at various points in time. And we see a band of red strains, which are tensile strains at the arch entrados here, just, uh, just below the application point of that axle, and then outside of that region, compression. So you can imagine your thrust lines look a little bit like this. If my axle load is here, I expect the thrust line to come, come quite close to the extrados here, so the intrados strains are going to be tensile. We see that. And then as the thrust line approaches the intrados over here, we get large compressive strains. Similar story when the axle load's in the middle or on the right-hand side of the bridge. So we can, that, that, these uh, quiver plots are matching up with what we'd expect from our thrust lines. Um, bit of long-term analysis of the FBG data. At the moment, there's only six months worth of data, and the temperature variation means that you can't see a clear variation with the, with the seasonal effect yet, but we are putting long-term monitoring on this bridge, and we will be able to see going forward the seasonal variation and long-term deterioration with the FBG data. And what will be really interesting will be to look at, at any changes in the direction of the principal strains. You can imagine if you get localized damage on your bridge, that's going to cause a redistribution of load. You can pick that up as the principal strains change direction. Uh, so summing up the FBGs, FBG rosettes can measure the magnitudes and directions of principal strains. Uh, principal strains, we've mapped that over the force, uh, so we've mapped that over the bridge, so that's revealed the force uh, flow through the skewed arch, and that's the first time this has been visualized. At CFM5, we found that it follows the skewed span direction. So maybe that's initially a bit of a surprise. Um, it might be influenced by the construction pattern of the arch barrel, but then again, it's a multi-ring arch with good interlock between the arch rings. So 
you wouldn't necessarily expect the stereotomy to have that large of an impact. Also, the width of the bridge. Some would argue this bridge is so narrow that you would expect the force to follow the skewed span direction, but there is a definite rectangle in the short diagonal in the square span direction. So you could imagine maybe that carries the, the load as a preferential load path. Um, there's nothing that we can see to indicate that the flow, for, the flow of force has been influenced by the recent intervention work, but what about historic def uh, deformation? So moving on to the laser scan analysis, uh, this was a laser scan taken in tw July 2018 by Dan Brackenbury and uh, processed by Simon Yee, who's sitting over there. Hello, Simon. Um, and uh, looking at this, we can see the arch has been segregated out of this point cloud. Um, you can just about see all the bricks are aligned with the skewed span direction, as I was saying earlier. Um, if we fit a best fit cylinder to that arch point cloud, then initially, if we constrain the best fit cylinder to have its axis in the horizontal plane, we see this, um, a certain amount of tilt. So we can say maybe there was a rigid body rotation of that uh, arch at some point in its history. If we now no longer constrain that to have its axis horizontal, we find that an inclination of 0.02 degrees, which is not very big. You could imagine that was uh, maybe the arch wasn't quite built as it was intended. Um, maybe there was a small amount of rigid body rotation at some point if there was support settlement. Then you get a much better fit of your best fit cylinder. And now we see these bands of deformation, which are more or less aligned with the transverse of the square span. So the square span is this direction here, the horizontal direction. Uh, so transverse to that, we see deformation bands. We also see a concentration of deformation here in the northwest corner and to a lesser extent here in the southeastern corner. So maybe there has been something interesting happening here at these supports. Uh, we can now fit some circles, best fit circles in the square span direction within this, this strip in the short diagonal. And we see as we try and find our best fit circle and then fit the error map for our point cloud to it, particularly at the north, you get a large deformation here in the northwest corner. So something is happening here. Um, now, we know typical ways in which an arch can deform. And based on that, we can hypothesize, uh, we can uh, have different hypothetical mechanisms of movement. So for settlement of a support or span opening, so horizontal support movement, we know how the arch is going to move more or less. We may not know exactly where the hinges are, but we know roughly what it will look like. Um, based on those movements, we know what the error map should look like if our point cloud is, uh, is showing us those movements. So we can try and fit those two mechanisms to the error maps we've got from our point cloud data. And that tells us that uh, if the northwest corner on the western uh, skewback has settled vertically, we would expect to see a four centimeter vertical movement at the middle of that abutment and a, no a seven centimeter movement downwards at the northwest corner. If, however, it's horizontal movement, you only need one centimeter of movement in the middle of that abutment and two centimeters in the northwest corner. So that seems a little more realistic to me, at least. Uh, and to sum that up, laser scan analysis have shown that historical movements appear to be aligned with the square span direction. And the cylinder fit shows that there's a concentration of deformation. You'd never be able to see that um, visually. You, you need to have dense data like this to be able to pick that up. Um, but we can hypothesize permissible mechanisms. We can demonstrate that uh, arch spreading is the most feasible of these. And we can also say, you know, this is a reasonable amount of movement to have happened over 150 years. So it makes sense from an engineering perspective. Um, and what we can also hypothesize is that uh, you could imagine that the reason there's some yielding here and some yielding here is that originally the load was carried by thrust in this direction. A small amount of yielding occurs at these corners and that's enough to cause load redistribution so that now the forces flow in the skewed span direction. So we can't really say anything definitive because we are talking about 150 years of history and we've only monitored for a very small fraction of that. But it's a, it's a story that makes sense in terms of engineering perspectives, I think. So it's a satisfying conclusion. Uh, future work, long-term monitoring with FPGs at this bridge, uh, particularly looking at seasonal variation and long-term trends. Some modeling of this bridge with a particular interest in the strain distribution on the arch intrados. That's why we're measuring our strains with the FPGs. We have very rich data for the intrados strains. Uh, so journal papers, some presentations to the clients. We're going to see Network Rail on uh, Friday this week and present what we've done. And that could lead to some more projects. Uh, there's other similarly damaged bridges which Network Rail are interested in. Um, I just had inspection reports for three bridges emailed to me. So there's uh, clearly interest in this kind of work from the client end. Um, and just to bring this to a, back to the larger picture again, alongside uh, Marshlane Viaducts, uh, which is work that Harris Electricus is doing, 
Um, these, uh, this, this research has been shortlisted with, in some industry awards recently. Uh, in the Rail Partnership Awards, we were shortlisted for best use of technology. In the end, we did lose that prize, but to another CSIC project, so I can't feel too bad about it. Um, the NCE Tech First Awards were shortlisted in three categories, Team of the Year, Rail Visionary Award, Best Use of Technology, Driving Whole Life Performance. Uh, those awards haven't happened yet, so hopefully we'll have a bit more luck this time around. And thank you for your attention. Thank you.